Hello and welcome to Season 8, Episode 24 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing apps. <laughs> and we'll also have some command line love. And of course, we'll go over your much, much appreciated feedback. I'm Laura. Hiya! Yeah! And joining me this week are Alan. Hello, hello. Martin. Hola. And Stuart's back. Good evening. Hello. So, how are you all, and what have you been up to since last time? Who's going first? Alan, you go first. You spoke. I have um, a Picade. Uh, it's, oh! Uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone thought I'd written Picard wrong, but it's Picade. It's um, an arcade cabinet uh, that sits on your desk, and uh, inside it, it's got a screen and a bunch of buttons and a joystick on the outside, and a screen driver, and uh, you stick a Raspberry Pi or a Raspberry Pi 2 in it, power it up, and uh, you can play arcade games on it. It's cool. Cool. Is have, it, you been, have you been reading about this miraculous thing, or do you now own one? I now own one. It's sat right next to me. Can you take, a photo, awesome. for the, can you take a photo for the show notes? I certainly will. I, um, I, you, it comes in kit form, um, and there's a few options, but the one I got, there was a special deal on. So I got it like 20 quid off or something. Um, and uh, I've put an SD card with a piece of software called RetroPie, which has a load of emulators on board for old school games like uh, Super Nintendo stuff and Genesis and arcade games and all that kind of stuff. And you just put your games on there and boot from it and then use the joystick to navigate and away you go. It's brilliant. It's very really nice. Awesome. That, that would be a Mega Drive if you were correctly oriented. But yes. Did I say Mega Drive? How? You said Genesis. Oh yeah. That's sorry. That's because I've just scrolled through the wind, the thing, and it says Genesis on the screen. Yes, Mega Drive. Sorry. <laughs> how, how how big is it? Um, it's just shorter than a lava lamp. <laughs> I can only say oh, that because right, okay. it's next to a lava lamp right now. Okay. <laughs> that's your retro uh, desk, is it? That, yeah, that's my that's my desk of retro things. Um, yeah, it's it's. Well, the screen, you can either get an 11-inch screen, I think, or I, I just got the 8-inch screen, the smaller one. And uh, it's all in a flat pack kit form. And uh, while I was watching telly one evening, I was sat with the instruction video uh, putting it all together. They've got a really nice video where the guy actually goes through making it on video. They say put set aside two and a half, two to two and a half hours for the, for the construction. Um, it took me a bit longer because I spread it over two days. But yeah, it's really good. Really cool and good fun and a great way to play games. And also, uh, because the Pi can be powered by a battery, I've just put a battery pack in there, a USB like, recharger battery pack. Whole thing's powered off that, so it's portable as well. You can carry it around and play games. It's like <laughs> a portable arcade cabinet. It's great. Like a really big Game Boy from the 80s. Yeah, yeah like a massive Game Boy with really <laughs> clacky switches and buttons to annoy the person on the train set next to you when you're playing it. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, yeah, fantastic. I've got a portable arcade cabinet, but that is a Game Boy. That's what a Game Boy is, <laughs> yeah. and it's loads smaller. Absolutely. And it makes, like, it's got a headphone socket, but you don't have to plug headphones in. You can just have it blaring out the speakers, which would be much better. Yeah. Stuart, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been playing with a thing called Jasper, which is, uh, again, a Raspberry Pi thing where um, it does the, the Siri or Cortana or Google Now thing where you can speak commands to it and then it does things and talks back to you. Ooh. So, so something like, you know, um, the Amazon, I can't think what it's called. Echo, yes. I think it's called. A little standalone device. And you can ask it questions. Jasper works the same way. Um, and you can, uh, there are a whole bunch of little plugins for it to talk to various things. So you can ask it about the weather or to do searches or uh, how much email you've got or to tweet for you or whatever. And you can write your own if you're that way inclined. Where's the audio and processing it, done? Is it local or in the cloud? Um, that they are spectacularly undiscriminating about this. So there are plugins for everything. They are determined that it won't be wedded to any one particular way of either generating speech or turning speech into text. So you can configure it to use Google's uh, in the cloud backend or AT&T's in the cloud backend, or there's another one begins in W, which I can't think of the name of, or you can have it use Sphinx, Pocket Sphinx locally, or you can have it use Julius locally. And generating voices, again, you can use Festival, or you can use Flight, or you can use Google's cloud speech generator or 
the one from the first version of Android or whatever. So they're fairly careful about making sure that it's not deliberately wedded to one specific implementation. So you can now properly do open the pod bay doors, how, and all of that. That's the theory, certainly. Um, uh, my biggest problem is that I don't have any external speakers, so I can. I, or I've pod bay doors, I very, imagine. Or, or, well, you'd be surprised what I've got in the flat, <laughs> but um, being tethered to it by the headphone lead doesn't make it a particularly useful thing. But I'm going to buy some speakers, and in theory, then being able to just walk in and say "T Earl Grey Hot" is somewhere on my list of things I'd like to be able to. Awesome. Really. Mm. So, really quickly. Martin, what have you been doing? Uh, four things which are strangely related. I'm uh, doing jury service at the moment, mm-hmm. and I've fixed my Nexus 6, which is good. And I also have a Pebble Time now, so I'm listening to podcasts on my Nexus on the bus and whilst I'm driving, and I'm using the Pebble to skip through them and change change them and all the rest of it, which is really great. And the reason for this is that Bluetooth on Ubuntu and Ubuntu Touch is quite busted, particularly on Ubuntu Touch. I can't get it to pair uh, yeah, with anything same. at the moment. <clears throat> but I've uh, I've learned uh, it's either today or yesterday. Uh, there's a discussion on the, or in fact, it was last week. It was last week. Uh, there's a discussion on the, the mailing lists about um, Blue, Blues Five is coming to Wiley, um, which is really great news, and it had been blocked. Um, because Ubuntu Touch uses the Blues 4 version that's in the archive at the moment, but they're going to forge on and bring Blues 5 to Wiley, and Touch is going to catch up and adopt it. So I'm really pleased about that because I've got a couple of components that require um, Blues 5 uh, that I want to get into the archive for Ubuntu Mate. Cool. Shall we go? I, I, apl- I applaud your restraint there, I have to say. I would describe it... Uh, slightly uh, with with a shorter and more fruity word than busted. busted. <laughs> <laughs> having att- having attempted to play with Bluetooth on a but it's yes. great to hear it's going to be fixed. Yes. So you might have noticed in my review of the Ubuntu phone uh, last time, uh, two weeks ago, that every time I came across an app being a web app and not a native app, I was a little bit sniffy about it. Um, Yeah, not that impressed. By web app, in this context, I mean a wrapper that goes around what is just a website, basically, in my view anyway. Um, So that's my opinion. Alan and Martin, as two people who've done some of these Ubuntu form web apps, what are your views? Well, actually, you didn't. You didn't say what your opinion was. You stated the facts of what they are. Yeah. What, and you said you were a bit sniffy. What What makes you sniffy? And you know, what? How does it make you feel when you see a web app? My heart sinks because, because... It, it gives promise of an app. Because on on Android, I I checked today, I have one hundred and seventy six apps installed which I know a lot of people don't use a lot of apps, but I do. Um, and <sighs> there was an article that Matt I say, um, uh tweeted recently that said that on the desktop, uh, people are happy not to use desktop clients anymore because the web is better, whereas on mobile, the web is not better and native apps are better. And that's my opinion. So um, you're saying that mobile uh, mobile uh web apps suck on mobile that's right is it uh using the web on mobile isn't great um i think that's partly it and so the experience of using a native app feels more integrated so you've it feels more integrated with the phone itself um it feels and that's maybe a misperception but it feels more like the data is with me and possibly even or that I, and more convenient because I can be logged in and feel like I can stay logged in um, I'm not going somewhere to get the experience um, it's here on my farm um, 
Yeah, it it so, just feels a whole lot more convenient. I, I can I can think of a couple of, like I, I'm trying. To, obviously, I don't know what 174 apps you use, but I would imagine there's some overlap between what apps you use and what, I, what apps I use, right? Uh-huh. So, for example, like the Gift Gaff app, the Gift yes. Gaff app on on Android is a handy app that lets you see Gift Gaff is our phone provider lets you see how many minutes you've got left and how much money you've got left and you, know, you can top up and and all those kind of th- the things you would want to do with your phone account right yeah. and the web app that i put in the store um is just the view on their mobile website which does exactly the same things and and technically if you're in the gif gaff app on android you can't do anything until you've got a connection because you can't find out how much data you've got left until yes. you connect so it's similar in that way in that the the, the 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 app is pretty much useless without an internet connection it might not be perfect in that the browser may refresh the entire page and it looks a bit bleh compared to an app that might have a nice spinner and animations and stuff but i i think those things are possibly fixable i don't know so this is where I was hoping Stuart could enlighten us as a, an app developer. Sure, he's, making, whether, he's waiting for us to all make fools of ourselves before he swoops in and tells us the facts. That we're wrong. Um, That's a terrible <laughs> suggest. I'd never do anything like that. It's a horrible calumny on the way I conduct argument. <laughs> Basically, is it, is, it, is it something intrinsic or is it just developers can't be bothered with website, making websites that work well on phones? Uh, no, yes, and possibly in that order. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple of examples. Um, on your phone, if you want to search for something, which app do you use? Uh, go to the web for that. Uh, but you don't find that to be... Th- there are plenty of search apps that basically take the results from Google and wrap them in their own thing and possibly show you an ad at the same time. Um, you could install one of those, but you haven't done so because the experience is okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, one example. The second thing, you've got 176 apps. Statistically, and you might be unusual here, but statistically, 20% or so of those apps will be what are called hybrid apps, mm-hmm. where it's it's a native application. It's not a pure website, but it's entirely built with web technologies. Mm-hmm. So, uh, this is, so if we take some of um, the apps that Alan's put in the store for Ubuntu Phone, as an example, like um, you did Panda Love and the other one. Um, they are they are built with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but they're not served from the web. They are local on your phone. They work without a connection. All the stuff they need is there. It just happens to be using HTML rather than QML as its implementation technology. Right, but yeah. the, the nature of it being local means that it's served up near instantly, whereas yes. my, my GIFGAF app, which is a, a traditional web app where everything is remote, it, as soon as I press any button in the page... It re- reloads the entire page, and that's and what really assets. annoys me. Right, and and, and, and the same I agree. Way. Yeah, um, there are again there are a couple of points here. Um, is it possible to make web apps which do not give you that experience and instead give you a slick native feeling experience? Yes, absolutely, it is. Do developers do it? Not as much as they should do. Is it possible on an Ubuntu phone? Not right now. Right. Because our browser browser engine isn't finished. Um, there's a there's a bunch of upcoming technologies which make this kind of thing work very well. So it is entirely possible right now, this second, to build uh, something calling itself a web app, where the first time you go there, it basically caches the thing. So then everything is running locally. You've still got to go off to the internet to get actual data. Um, so the amount of minutes you've used on GifGaf, for example, but so would a native app. That's yeah. uh, the nature of the beast, you know. But the idea that it has to reload the whole interface every time you change a page, you do not have to do that as a web app. Um, are developers doing that? Not all the time. Are they concentrating on giving you slick 60 frame per second animations? Not all the time, but it's possible to do so. Yeah, because I mean, I'd say that that's when people started switching to being comfortable using the web was the point at which web apps started re- like responding in the way that a uh, desktop app would. Exactly. So the the advantage with the web is that it's possible to build something which works like a desktop application where the app itself is, is essentially installed locally. Um, that's possible on Ubuntu by having someone package it up and put it in the store as Alan did with Panda Love or whatever. 
Um, oh, that was Sturmflop, was it? I'm not sure. Yeah, I did. Um, I did a couple, and he did a couple. But yeah. basically, it was, you know, an app that someone had created, which works on the web. So you could visit a website and see this, you know, this app and use it. It turned out to be a game. Um, but also, the code was on, you know, GitHub or wherever, and you can get it and package that up inside an app and it all gets served up and and in fact we had comments from people who played with those games on ubuntu phone on the slowest phone we have the bq aquarius 4.5 and said that felt like a native app it felt like i was playing you know a game natively now you could argue about what the word native means whether it means you know qml or bare metal c plus plus or assembler written using a magnifying glass and a butterfly <laughs> but you know, it it's that the doesn't perception. really matter if it's the feel of it, yeah. Exactly. It's that it's that perception. The feel that you know, when I open this game it opens near instantly or it has a quick splash. Um and doesn't I don't see a loading bar that, that would make me think, ha, this is a browser and I'm loading a website, which a lot of them do. Mm. Precisely. So yes, as as you say, Laura, it's it's about the feel. People tend to use native as code for it doesn't take ages to load and doesn't show me a spinner all the time and doesn't reload its interface as well as the data. Um, I, I, that is, native means good, and web means annoying and slow and rapid, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, which is not a totally unreasonable view to take. It is, however, a wrong view to take. <laughs> so, so why aren't people yes, doing it? it? Why, why is it that, you know, to be fair, web apps suck at the moment. They, they suck quite badly, a lot of them. So is it just because they don't have to create web apps because the only two platforms that they care about are Android and iOS and on those they have rich SDKs that they can use to create native apps and things that allow them to create, you know, let's use the word native for you know, local apps. And so why would they ever want to create a mobile experience for the two people who use Windows Phone? Well, that that's part of the point. There's, as I say, about 20% statistically of all the apps in the stores are uh, built with web technology. So, Laura, out of your 176, probably 35 of them mm -hmm. will be hybrid apps. But you've got no idea that they're hybrid apps. They don't advertise themselves as such. No. And they're, they're using HTML and CSS and JavaScript, which is on the phone, packaged with the application itself. When you install it from the App Store, you've got no idea that it happens to be using HTML. So, people are doing that a lot. You know, one in five apps is developed that way. Why aren't people delivering this on the web itself, you know, completely avoiding the App Store? There are a couple of reasons. The first one is that unless you're running a very modern browser, it's difficult. And by modern, I mean essentially Chrome and how to push Firefox. IOS Safari does not qualify. Mm. So it's difficult to make an app which feels that slick and native and deliver it purely over the web because you can't do that to iOS, which cuts out half of your market. Um, the, the There is a big argument going on about whether iOS Safari doesn't do this because they just haven't got round to it yet, or because Apple don't want a world in which you can deliver everything over the web and avoid the App Store. Um, and the position you take on that argument is basically defined by how you feel about Apple as a company. <laughs> so leave that to one side. The second reason why people don't do it and put things in the app stores is for discoverability. Because people are now conditioned to the idea, I want that, there's an app for that, I'll go to the app store, and that's the first place they go to find things. People don't think, I'll go to the web and search. They go to the app store, and they'll, they'll trip over apps and go, oh, that looks interesting, I wonder what's new here go through and look and you can't do that with the web because there's no big list of everything that's new since the last time you looked so there is i mean panda love as an example why did you um why did you package it up rather than just delivering it over the web it's perfectly right. possible to have it so the first time you go there it caches everything and then after that you will get that native like experience because i'm one of them for me before bear, bear me, before you go on and explain the other thing um one of the reasons probably not to do that on an Ubuntu phone is there's no way of bookmarking a website to make it look like an app. Mm. Right. So the add to your home screen thing that iOS has, we don't have yet. Correct. And uh, Chrome has it on Android now, eventually, finally. It used to have it, but it was buried away in 13 layers of menu. iOS did a really good job of this in like iOS 1. And since then, they haven't touched it. Ubuntu doesn't have it at all, and there is no way of doing it, he says, having tried. <laughs> um, it requires support from 
uh, the the Ubuntu team, the core Ubuntu team. And, right. you know, with like three people working on the browser, Chrome can afford to do this because they've got a team of thousands. Chrome have more people delivering post-it notes than we have working on Oxide. So the, <laughs> the, reason I, the reason I packaged up those games and put them in the store actually was twofold. One was to prove that it could be done. Um, and secondly was because I sometimes go places where I don't have any coverage on my phone. And I quite like being able to play a game where I don't have to sit there and wait until yes. I come back into coverage before I can play my next move or, you know, attack the zombies or do whatever. I, I like playing games that are offline totally on my device. And so those that's the reason I did it, like partly to prove that it could be done so that other people could do the same thing. And in fact, I, I, I contacted a couple of indie devs and said, hey, I like your game in our store. How about I port it for you? And by porting, I mean put it in a directory and create three text files, job done turned out to be more than that but um <laughs> uh but you know it's pretty straightforward to take an html5 app i happen to choose games but there are apps that you could do that with as well if then i mean and and one of the places you know this so this this is something that the firefox os you know was supposed to be really really good at is html5 apps because the whole thing is built with html5 um, yes and and so you would expect there to be a plethora of apps in their marketplace. And there are some, and there's a few that I looked at and thought, well, you know, we could port those across. But a lot of them use Firefox-specific stuff that absolutely doesn't work in our browser. So they would need significant porting, and that was beyond my capabilities at this point in time. It would be lovely if we could find all those bits of code inside those Firefox OS apps. And not just Firefox OS apps, but anything that is specific to a particular browser and make them more generic or make them work in our browser. That would be awesome. Um, yeah, starting that fight is not the way to go. It no. is a shame that, that Firefox OS apps tend to lean on Firefox-specific functionality. Um, so it is perfectly possible, as I say today, there are there are two or three apps on my Android home screen, which are pure web apps. They never came from an app store. I went to the website... Um, uh, use the app, bookmarked it to my home screen. They work perfectly fine offline, not a problem. It is possible right now today, and it's possible to give the the native feel and experience as well. It doesn't look like a website with, you know, blue underlined text all over <laughs> the place. Um, so it is doable. Are people doing it? Not as much because, uh, as I say, partially because there's um, – it's harder to do unless you have a super modern browser, which web browser app on Ubuntu phones isn't yet, although hopefully it will be. iOS Safari isn't yet, so you're cutting off some of your market. There's a bunch of useful extra things that being an app gives you. Discoverability, as I mentioned, is one. Being able to charge money for it easily is another one. Things like in-app payments, because they're tied into uh, features that the operating system provides. But in practice, I bet you don't use that many apps with in-app payments. Um, the you get integration into the phone if you're a proper native application as well. Um, so you can do things like uh, log in with Facebook, example. Use um online, use the online account services. Mm. Now, again, that's something where on Ubuntu phone, uh, people in general are not using the online account stuff because it's not really finished and not very well documented yet. I would like to think that we will that we will start seeing the majority of Ubuntu apps which require that kind of thing using online accounts rather than rolling their own. But there's not enough pushback from users for apps which don't do that. Mm. We ought to be, that, there ought to be a reason to rate applications down. That If what we want is native because it integrates with the platform, then when you build an app, it should integrate with the platform. And if you don't integrate with the platform, then you are wrong and get downvoted. Well, one so thing that that's... doesn't help here is we actually created a website on developer.ubuntu.com a mini site where you could just put in the URL of a website, press a button, uh, you know, put in your name, and it generates a click package that you could then instantly upload to the store. And I, I personally, you know, it's a, it's a stepping stone towards you know being a developer, but it's a very, very, it's like a dolly step towards being a developer. It's not a and, like a strong and more importantly it's pretty much guaranteed to provide bad experiences to yes. people because you're using something pretending to be an app which is not set up for being that kind of app. It's not set up to um, to allow it to be downloadable and addable to the home screen and cache all its data locally and concentrate hard on being 60 frames per second. People just use it essentially as a bookmark. Yeah. 
you know, mm. which which is rather like saying we need to solve the world hunger crisis by just building McDonald's everywhere. It solves the problem, sort of, but it's not really a long term good approach. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, I, so to answer your question, yes, it is possible. Um, it's harder on a Ubuntu phone. It could be more possible than it is, and that is being worked on. One of the larger problems that we have is that people dislike things and say, "I don't like this because it's a web app," which means that. The people who can actually fix this problem, decent web developers, get their backs up about it because you're going, I hate your thing because it's the web. I want native apps. And what you want is web apps with good experiences. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a, it's a case of changing the argument a bit because if you just say, well, I just hate the web. I want native apps. It alienates people who think, fine, I'll just do native apps then. And if we get into a battle where, we want native apps. Ubuntu phone is going to lose. We're never going to have as many people as iOS and Android, not for a couple of years at least, and probably not ever. So we want to get people on side. But every time you use an app which is a web app and feels like a web app, rate it one star and say, this feels like a web app. Mm. Every time you use a web app which doesn't feel like a web app, rate it up and say, this is good. But it's got to be a cultural shift for Ubuntu phone. We've got to build a world in which we reward people for providing good web ac- good app experiences and vote down people who do not i'd also like us to fix that web app generator so that it has you know would you like to use online accounts you know add yeah. little tick boxes like that and when the sound menu is done i know there's some work being done on the sound menu so you know if your website is uh like a groove shark like thing i know groove shark has gone away but a groove shark like mu- music streaming service web web page then maybe it could integrate with the sound menu so you can pause and you know stop and flick tracks uh from the sound menu which will happen which will land soon and you know things like that need a little bit of extra another text file another bit of tweaking but you know we could allow people to generate web apps that don't suck as much as the web apps that currently exist do so do you think there are certain types of apps that are better as one or the other or because you said about the hardware integration um for instance if you're going to be recording gps traces you need to be hooked into the gps so presume, uh, presumably a local app makes more sense in that context? Not really. Um, a web app could do that just as happily. It, okay. can, um, it can read your geolocation and everything. Um, applications like that are hard to write in the Ubuntu web browser because your app keeps getting suspended. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, your, your web page keeps getting suspended if it's not the foreground application. But then again, that's exactly the same case for native apps. If I wrote something which was yeah. a native app and recorded the GPS thing, as soon as I lock the phone screen it stops recording that's the life cycle yeah. <laughs> um so there is some stuff which is which is better native if you need tight integration to hardware or tight integration to other features on the phone then i mean uh, if we come up with a phone with a fingerprint reader for example then that would be relatively easy to work with as a native application it would be hard from the web um yes so that's something but in practice there's not actually that much stuff that you need for that and 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 to be honest with you the web it provides a it's a slightly more sandboxed api a slightly more sandboxed set of features there are things which you can do with native that you just flat can't do from the web but the web in general provides a much broader range of things you can do than something like qml does because qml's got 60 people working on building it and the web's got 600 million so there's a load more stuff you can do because we're inheriting uh blink which is uh oxide which is the ubuntu browsers uh web rendering engine is a fork of blink which is google chrome's web rendering engine so we've got uh, the perfect team out there working on building stuff which benefits our platform without us having to do it well without Without us having slightly less work so what about, say, um, things where you want to have the data? I mean, um, like, say, travel apps where you've got your travel. Uh, is it TripIt? TripIt has a local app where you can store all your TripIt information. You don't have to have an internet connection, I don't think, um, to just view your information. Um, it, there's no reason why any of that couldn't be done with web apps because as long as it caches your data locally, presumably. Correct. Yep. 
yeah, you can quite happily do that with a web app again. Mm-hmm. But this presupposes that um, the the site or or project in question has a documented API for you to be able to have a local app that can contact that remote site and pull down your trips, for example, and sign in and download securely your trips, for example. Absolutely, but that's the case regardless of what technology you build the app with. If you want to build a trip right. app. If TripIt build a TripIt app, then they don't need to document the API. But again, then we get back to the point that people aren't, in general, building apps for Ubuntu Phone because we're not popular enough yet. Right. But if you want to build a TripIt app, it doesn't matter what technology you build it in. You could build you could build the app in QML and Qt, or you could build it in HTML and CSS locally, or HTML and CSS served by website, or you could build the whole thing in COBOL if you like. You still need an API. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm guessing there's a difference as well between just using the web technologies to build an app that's local versus just having really good mobile websites on the original website that could do the same experience. In in theory, there's no difference between them. Um, if you're if you if you ship an app bundle to the phone from the store, which contains web technology, HTML, and CSS and JavaScript. That could have just as easily been deployed as a mobile website, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, in practice, if you're building an app with web technologies, then you can build it and ship it to the phone, and it can be Ubuntu-specific, whereas TripIt aren't going to build an Ubuntu-specific website. So they may build a great web app, but it's not going to look like an Ubuntu phone app. Right. right. Yes. I think the theory was that, you know, with Firefox uh, making – HTML5 a first class citizen and HTML5 being part of the Tizen SDK and HTML5 apps running on Yola and us doing HTML5 apps I think there was this uh, this feeling that um, third party developers would create HTML5 apps that would work cross platform across all of those obviously that hasn't happened but um, or hasn't happened for the most part or yet depending on your point of view um <laughs> And so, you know, we we haven't caught that wave of, you know, or it hasn't happened yet. I I, I still feel it it could, but mm-hmm. it needs push. Well, as well I mean, this is back to the point I was making earlier. Twenty percent of applications are hybrid apps. They are HTML and CSS and JavaScript web technologies, right, still... HTML five apps in a native container. So right. essentially, you're building a web app but using the stores to deliver it. Right, exactly. And there's, as there, there'll be some is. native nonsense in there as well, like you know, for like Play API or the uh, App Store API or integrating with some other platform specific stuff. Even if it's underneath the covers, even if there is some HTML five stuff, you can bet there's some you know platform specific nonsense in there as well, though. Yeah, to some extent. Um, one of the advantages with using uh, Apache Cordova, or PhoneGap as was, Adobe PhoneGap, is that you can build your app with that and then get a set of plugins which provide access to native functionality. So talk about things like uh, integrating with online accounts or the, your Facebook online account on an Android or iOS phone. You can just say, add this plugin, and then there's a little... Ver- so that's a little bit of actual native code and there's a version for each platform that that PhoneGap supports. So you just build your app in with web technologies and then say install this plugin and then you get that native integration we were talking about without having to go full native and fully platform specific for the application. Hmm. Interesting. Um unfortunately we've run out of time on this uh this subject so we need to move on but um has that answered your question Laura? Yeah, I feel more enlightened now. Thank you. It, it doesn't change the fact that, yes, all the web apps on uh, Ubuntu phones suck. <laughs> well, not <laughs> all of them. <laughs> an awful lot of them do. I feel the same way. I dread the fact that I see an app and go, great, it's an app. And then it's like, oh, no, it's not an app. It's just the it's just a website in a window. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's, it's not an app is the problem. It's just a website. I might as well have just gone to it in the browser. So it doesn't solve your problem. But now, now I understand perhaps you can more. see that there could be a solution to it if developers did it right. Mm. Moving on. It's time for a very quick uh, command line love, which I obtained from George Castro this week 
and the one I love this week is called Comcast. And uh, what it is, is a tool that you can run on your machine to simulate having a bad internet connection. And the reason why it's called Comcast is in America, traditionally, that's a terrible ISP that gives you bad connection. Um, and the idea behind this is you can simulate what it would be like for your app users or your system users who have these problems. So the kind of things it can it can do is it can introduce... Uh, latency into your uh, into the connection it can you can um, throttle the bandwidth down to a particular uh, level so you could simulate someone on a very low bandwidth ADSL connection for example um, and you can also simulate packet loss as well to see how your app uh, copes when uh, maybe a person is using it on a train or you know uh, on, a, on some mobile device of some kind uh, but it's on github and uh, yeah it's called comcast it's quite cool. I particularly like their table at the bottom, which is network condition profiles, and it's got GPRS and Edge, and it tells you, you know, for everything from GPRS all the way through to satellite, what your latency and bandwidth and packet loss value should be to sort of simulate those uh, types of connection. Um, I'm going to use this at work because uh, we get data from aircraft from all manner of different uh, connectivity medium so this would be really great for testing our software uh, uh, in a more representative way of the, the the customers using it so that's a pretty good find i like that yeah awesome and uh apparently uh stuart wrote a blog post some time ago about this what was that about stuart <laughs> precisely this actually <laughs> um uh, Comcast is an external thing, but you can just fiddle with your uh, your network yourself if you want to. There's there's a couple of fairly impenetrable commands, so using something like Comcast is a much nicer way of doing it. But the feature is right there built into Ubuntu to be able to throttle or slow down individual network interfaces. Um, is is this using um, oh God, what's it called? Trickle, or is this uh, using uh, IP tables? The the there is a command called TC, mm. um, which is, I mean, it's obviously an extremely hardcore network engineer's command because it's completely impenetrable, <laughs> the syntax for it. Right. But it lets you kind of add rules to uh, to various network interfaces to say, slow this down or delay it by 500 milliseconds before replying or anything like that. Um, and you can apply it to localhost as well. So you can test things locally. As though you're accessing them over a slow mm. network. It's really cool. Nice. The one thing I would I wish more people would test is uh, what happens when your app is behind a proxy um, uh, or a really restrictive firewall, because a lot of app developers don't test that, and uh, often uh, there's no way for you to you know tunnel your way out through a proxy server if the app doesn't know what a proxy server is or have any you know, method for you to tell it what a proxy server is. That's frustrated me immensely in the past with <clears throat> Ubuntu One File Sync. But now the source is out there, I can uh, fix that problem myself. You can, indeed, <laughs> in fact, yeah. I mean, clearly, setting a proxy is the operating system's job. It should not be settable in each application. Right. Uh, but also, clearly, applications should pay attention to yes, it. absolutely. Which they don't. So if you have any uh, funky ways of uh, messing up your network, uh, do email us, show at ubuntupodcast.org. It's now time for your feedback. Peter Cliff emailed us, show at ubuntupodcast.org, and said, I've been using the Ubuntu phone as my main phone since May, only phone since May, um, but last week I flashed it to Android. Boo. Um, yeah, boo. I wanted to see how the hardware fared on a different OS, and because I became too frustrated by the network connectivity problems I was having, it kept dropping data, and it wasn't possible to connect to Wi-Fi and cellular networks at the same time because there was a bug. Yeah, we hit that, didn't we? In basic, in I wonder if he's in, I wonder if he's installed Comcast on his phone. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> uh, in summary, his view is that Ubuntu Phone isn't quite ready yet. I'm not convinced by scopes, and I like the sweep from the. But I do like the swipe from the right to swap apps. Uh, the music player is great, and the screen is bright enough to read an ebook in full sunlight. And in fact, he's written a lot more about his experiences as he comes across them on his blog, which is so petercliff.net. Yes. Yeah, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes because it's quite a lot in there, I think. 
Awesome. Uh, James Lewis emailed us. He's been using Ubuntu phone since just before 13.10 was released and gave us some good and bad feedback on the phone. My most show-stopping bugs, issues and missing features include 1. The applications need a way to tell the system that they are busy and shouldn't be killed to save resources and the system should not kill applications that have been used very recently and there appears to be a bug filed about that. This is because one cannot listen to a podcast or do anything else, especially something heavily like uh, look like go- uh, browsing Google+, Plus, because after a few minutes, Podbar- Podbird will be killed. I've experienced that. This issue also means that one cannot browse Google+, Plus or any social media, read linked web pages, and return to comment on them, because the system will have always killed the social media app <laughs> when you return to comment. Yep. <laughs> Yep, I've been there too. And, so that, uh, the app that frame. is, that is mm. uh, a known bug with the amount of memory consumption that the uh, browser has and the fact that the BQ Aquarius only has one gig of RAM and we exhaust oh, yeah. that amount of RAM very quickly. As soon as you open two websites, boom, they're gone. And so, yeah, that, right. that is a problem. So, Laura, you've got the MX4. Have you, mm. Do any of these sound familiar to you? Um, it still happens, but I think not as much. Yeah, way which less. Makes right. sense with yeah. what you just said. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a lot less frequent on the MX4, which is nice. I mean, I, I appreciate, you know, the BQ's got less memory, but it's still got a gigabyte of memory. Yeah, a gigabyte seems <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it does. Right. It does. And uh, he also points out that the app framework does not have a way for an application to wake up and check for updates such as new mail or new podcasts on a schedule. So after sitting on the broadband Wi-Fi after night, I end up downloading five new podcasts on mobile data after leaving the house each morning. <laughs> <laughs> I've <Ooh>. been there too. <laughs> yeah. I, th- yeah. Totally I think um, Podbird developers are implementing a fix for that by having a push notification server that holds a list of all your subscriptions and it sends a notification to your phone and triggers your phone to start downloading overnight. So that that will fix. That will be worked around stroke fixed with uh new versions of Podbird in the future, I believe. Uh Jezra left a comment on the website. If there's a problem with copy and paste between um web apps, uh why not just remove the web apps and use the browser instead? Sure you'd lose the wonderful swipe to switch web page ability and you'd have to use the clunky tab management, but you should be able to copy and paste at will. Nope. It's, no, it's web still pages broken. themselves that, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the the problem is not that they're web apps. You can't cut, copy and paste into and out of the web browser either. It's the most annoying thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be a problem if three quarters of the apps were web apps, as previously discussed. Well, the big, yeah, the big one is LastPass. You know, if you've got your super complicated password in LastPass and you try and copy and paste it out. It, uh, yeah, we've, we've talked about that before. Yeah. Um, You'll get there. Pixelated Pete left a comment on the website. Quoting not consumer ready and quoting you as again as it ain't ready jars a bit with the the idea that Ubuntu phone has been designed with obsessive attention to detail from the glossy marketing of the Ubuntu phone site. Uh, Pete goes on to say, I got nervous when you said the Kubuntu Plasma mobile stuff had a nice website as well. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, Torin Doyle from Ireland emailed us. In episode 22, someone asked if you can transfer files to and from a phone without using the cloud. You mentioned USB and Bluetooth. Another option is using FTP, that's something like FileZilla on GNU Linux and an FTP server app like Primitive FTP on the smartphone. This is handy as it's a desktop environment. It's, it's desktop environment independent. You wouldn't want to use Primitive FTPD, though. You want to use mm-hmm. Wi-Fi transfer because I wrote it and it's excellent and it does precisely that. <laughs> excellent. Yeah, what it's called, what is, what Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi transfer? What does it do, Wi-Fi transfer? I've never used it. Um, if you're a techie person, it's an FTP server. Right. If you're if you're not a techie person, um, what it does is it allows you to connect to your phone from your desktop, any desktop, whether that's um, Ubuntu or Kubuntu or a Windows or Mac or whatever, and then copy files on onto and off of your phone. Nice Wi-Fi transfer. Is it in the App Store? It is super. Uh, Ivan Pejic. Uh, Pajic, I think. Sorry, Ivan. Emailed us some questions about Ubuntu phone. Oh, golly. Go for it. Yes. So he, he asks, uh, five questions. So I'll give the questions and then give the answers afterwards. Um, the questions are, I want to make a phone call. So I tap the contacts. Can I start typing to filter the list? Second question is, can SMS messages be shown as threaded conversations? 
Third question, the phone rings and buzzes and flashes on an incoming call. Can I flip the phone so it's got the screen pointing down and then make it stop making noise and making visual cues? He says, uh, can I track the carrier's monthly data usage and put a limit on it, importantly? And can I remove all the attention-grabbing stuff on my home screen and leave only the clock? And your internationalized answers are no, niet, nichts, nine, and no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sure that I'm sure these things are coming at some point. Um, having uh, a limited data transfer would be marvelous, um, but we don't currently have that. And yeah, there's a lot of that stuff. It would be nice to see something like a third-party SMS app, which uh, allows you to frame things differently rather than necessarily waiting for the core messaging app to be updated. But I don't know if it's possible to write third-party messaging apps. Um, hmm. hmm. The one that's in the in the phone is unconfined, so that's a special yes. one. Uh, I, I don't think it, I think if a third party were to write, if some another app developer were to write a messaging app or a dialer app or whatever, and you put it in the store, it wouldn't have access to the messages. So you could write it and release it unconfined, but it needs special review from mm. Canonical to do that. Okay. So so it would be possible, mm. um, but as far as I'm aware, none of those things are currently possible. Ivan, we apologise for the con- inconvenience. For the contacts thing, it does have quite a neat alphabet thing down the side that I find useful for just finding somebody's oh, name. Oh, the quick scroll, yes. Yeah, you don't have to scroll all the way down to P to find somebody like Pulpy. You can just touch P on the side. Uh, surely I would be one of your favourites, so you just click favourites at the top. You're in last I'm... number redial. Of course. <laughs> sure, surely you'd be at the top because it's A for Alan. <laughs> I'm glad you said Alan <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> Nige left a comment on the website saying if the issue with ripping audio CDs is based on the legalities of format shifting then this throws up an interesting scenario a lot of CDs display their contents contents as a list of WAV files on Linux and you can copy those WAV files from the CD and play them on nearly any device as long as you have plenty of storage space result a ripped CV and no change of format as was agreed on the show the law is a nonsense. Yes, and I think that was the point I was making about CDs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> However, I, I think we all agree the law is a nonsense, but the law is also not completely stupid. Right? <laughs> They're not actually, it's not actually just a, a data CD full of WAV files. You're being faked out by the CD hub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, the man is not completely dense. Go, no, there's no change of format here. They're going to go, you know what? Wrong. Go to jail. The law is stupid, but you do still have to go to jail. Uh, do not pass go and do not collect £200. Pounds. Um, so, or well, probably not go to jail that. in practice. Yes. But as, as we agreed um, last show or two shows ago, whenever we discussed this, none of us have ever done this and uh, have deleted any audio or CDs that we may have ripped in the nine months it was legal. But I'm quite impressed that in my Amazon Prime account, I have access to everything that I bought as presents for other people in the past. Yes, that raises an interesting point, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, every time oh, you buy yeah. a physical <laughs> you, CD You don't want to know Amazon. what music I've got access to, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got you know, access to El Devo and stuff like that from CDs I've bought my mum at Christmas. And yeah. yeah, yeah, your mum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David <laughs> also left a comment about CD ripping. <laughs> I heard that somewhere in the USA, under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that copying DVDs and CDs to your computer is perfectly legitimate now. In the US. Might be in the US. Mm. <laughs> I don't think that's a DMCA thing, though. But, yes. It's they, a fair um, use provision, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, format shifting is not illegal in the States, or unlawful in the States, and it is here again, ridiculously. I think we've agreed. Yeah. Did we? You sure? Yeah. Right. Good. Right. Let's put that one to bed, shall we? Um, <laughs> so, uh, Torin emailed to ask I've heard you mention Tab Suspender a few times. Is this add on open source? I can't find anything mentioning its license. You mentioned that it's for Chrome and Firefox, but I don't see a Firefox version. Um, I only use it under Chrome. I don't use it under Firefox, and I don't know what the license is. Maybe I should have checked that. That was very remiss of me. But I'm using it under Chrome, which is not free anyway. So, uh, <laughs> yes, it's. Um, However, go on. I my understanding is is that this feature is going to be built into Chrome and Chromium soon. Hurrah! Chromium is open source, so you yep. will have a tab suspension facility that is open source on Chromium. 
in the not too distant future. I would be surprised. I was surprised when I heard you say on the previous show that it's available for both, because the way that it would work under Chrome and the way it works under Firefox would be fundamentally different. It's entirely possible they've just written two completely different versions of tabs. Well, no, all the, I mean, have you seen how it actually works? It just changes the URL on the tab that is suspended yeah. to a blank HTML page. To an internal, yeah, an internal one, yeah. one. And then when you reload the page, it just redirects you back to the page that reloads. So it's not, it's not yeah, no, absolutely. Special, what it does. It's not like uh, the process-specific the... limiting or anything like that. No, no, but the way the extension works is to use the Chrome.tabs API, which obviously only exists under right. Chrome, and the way you do that under Firefox is, will be quite different. Okay. Uh, finally, David King left a comment on our website. Uh, go for it, Laura. In regards to Flash and using Amazon Prime videos, one of you mentioned it worked okay. I currently cannot get it to work on Ubuntu on my PC, 1404 Ubuntu Studio, but it worked okay on a friend's laptop running Linux Mint 13. I've also managed to get it working on Open Elect Kodi on Raspberry Pi. So what might I need to do to get it working on my Ubuntu desktop? I've tried Firefox and Chromium. I've got Flash installed and allowed. I've also installed Pipelight, the Linux version of Silverlight, and I allowed scripts on Amazon in Firefox and have no script installed. I know the answer to this question. <laughs> Shall I tell us, Martin? This one. Go for it. Okay. If it's less than um, thirty first, seconds, yes. The Say it first thing you need to do is go to your Amazon account and switch your playback preferences from Silverlight to Flash. Uh, that option exists for uh, the UK now. The next thing you need is to be using Firefox and the Adobe Flash plugin. And then you also need a utility called HAL Flash, which is a library stub that presents just the bit of HAL that provides the crypto libraries that Adobe Flash needs to download the DRM decrypting module. And I've packaged that for all versions of Ubuntu in a PPA. So if you search for PPA HAL Flash, uh, you'll find two. Uh, mine is um, uh, flexion.org is the username. And if you add that PPA and install it, that will give you everything you need. And that will also enable you to watch things like Channel 4 On Demand and Channel 5 and TV Catch Up and other services that require DRM playback using Flash. Awesome. Nice. nice and comprehensive. That would be a super useful thing to put into the actual archive rather than a PPA, that. Yeah, I'm trying to get it in through Debian at the moment. Nice one. Well, Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for all your feedback. And that's all for episode 24. We'll be back again next week when we'll have more news, comment and discussion. It's a bumper episode, that one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And It's an oh, epic. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say sorry for the loud music in the last episode. Um, As I fade got... the music up to drown you out. <laughs> sorry. That's fine. Um, yeah, a few people tweeted uh, kind, constructive feedback. Basically... I don't know, Mark said compress the tracks, Brain Mark. He's the not presenter's here. tracks, yeah. and so I did, and I considered Samantha a presenter, and apparently I shouldn't. Don't. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks Bye-bye. for coming. <laughs> <laughs>